So in the second video of this series on how to build a circuit on a breadboard based on a circuit diagram, we are going to kick the difficulty up a notch and now have a circuit with multiple LEDs and resistors and we're going to add some new components to our circuit, buttons and switches. So if this looks a little too overwhelming and you skipped the first video in this series, you probably wanna go watch that first. You can find that link in the description below this one. That's gonna go over some of the basics with a much simpler circuit. This and further videos in the series are going to work on more complex circuits and how to interpret this diagram and build the corresponding physical circuit on a breadboard. So what I've done here is added all of the small parts that I'm going to need to my screen. I didn't add the battery pack yet because the battery is physically pretty large and we would have to zoom out to see it next to the breadboard. But I want you to get a sense of how big these parts are. And in this case, when you have a more complex circuit, you kind of need to plan out how you're going to physically lay things out on the breadboard. And again, I covered in that first video how the physical layout on the breadboard does not necessarily have to match the physical layout of the circuit diagram. But in this case, since we have four branches of the circuit that are pretty similar, we have a resistor in series with an LED, and one of them has a little extra button in series with the resistor, it might make sense to kind of arrange things so I'd have four similar branches on the breadboard, and there are different ways I could do that. And if I know this is all I'm going to build, I could kind of space things out and take up a lot of space on the breadboard. If I know I'm gonna be adding more stuff later, I could kind of keep it compressed towards one side of the breadboard and save myself some more space. But what I'm gonna do is say, I want to put an LED maybe every five rows to give myself plenty of space. And remember that you cannot just put an LED with both legs in the same row of a breadboard like this because those will be shorted together. Again, that's covered in the first video. I'm gonna rotate my LEDs so they're in two adjacent rows like this. So I'm gonna start in row five, I'm gonna put one in row 10, and I'm gonna go down to row 15 and row 20. So I'm just kind of choosing a component to start my circuit with. Again, it doesn't have to be the LEDs. I could have said I'm gonna start with the resistors instead, but I'm just choosing my LEDs to kind of build my circuit around. And in this case, since I have multiple LEDs, I'm going to space them out evenly like this. Now. I, again, I don't have to do that. There are multiple valid ways to build a circuit. For example, maybe you want to bridge the gap in the middle of the breadboard with your LEDs instead. Tinkercad here doesn't really let me extend the legs of those LEDs, but I can kind of fake it by using a gray wire. So instead of putting all my LEDs on one side of the breadboard like this, I could have them bridge that gap in the middle and say I'm gonna put all four LEDs across the breadboard like that. But let's actually, yeah, let's switch to doing that since in the first video, I believe I put them in like this. So I'm gonna rotate all my LEDs and add little long wires for the legs here. So now they are going across the gap in the middle of the breadboard. And again, this is really just a matter of preference. Ultimately, what I build is going to be electrically equivalent either way. So instead of having my LEDs sideways like that here in Tinkercad, I'm gonna have them bridging the gap in the middle of the breadboard. So you can sort of start to visualize how I've kind of taken this whole circuit diagram and rotated it 90 degrees physically to put my LEDs across here. The next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and connect my resistors. So the resistors are connected to the anode or positive side of each LED, and then eventually that is gonna go up to my power bus. So in this case, I'm gonna rotate my resistors 90 degrees and just connect them directly from the LED over to the power bus. Again, there is more than one way to do that. I could, for example, rotate a resistor like this and then use a jumper wire to connect it over to the power bus electrically. That is equivalent. I still have a path for current to flow from power through the resistor to the LED, but it's just not as compact as it could be. And I have an extra jumper wire in there that I don't really need. So the most compact way to do that is going to be to just use the resistor to go straight over to the power bus. So I'm going to do that with each of my resistors, actually I'm gonna do it with three of them, and we'll talk about the button later. So this one you see has an extra button in series with the resistor there. And note that I haven't labeled the colors of the LEDs in this diagram, I just kind of picked one of each color. I didn't indicate that it matters in the diagram, so I'm just kind of arbitrarily choosing, okay, we're gonna put the button on that yellow one. So look at the other side of my LEDs. Those are all gonna be connected to ground. Here I am gonna use jumper wires to go over to my ground bus, and remember again, for color coding, we're usually gonna use black for ground. So I'm gonna go over to ground from each of those. 
And I said earlier, we're not really going to connect the battery pack yet. So now I've started thinking about connecting to power and ground. I should think about how I am going to connect my battery pack. And again, as mentioned in the first video, when you are just using a single voltage supply, a single battery pack, you are usually going to want to connect the buses on the left and right side of your breadboard so you have power and ground easily available everywhere. So I am going to make sure I connect my left and right ground buses and connect my left and right power buses. And again, I'm going to use a red wire for that. That's the color we usually use for power. So now I have power and ground available everywhere on my breadboard, but I haven't connected my battery pack yet because in the previous video, what I had was a battery pack just connected directly to those power buses. So I had a four by AA battery and I just had the negative wire from the battery pack go to the ground bus on the breadboard and the positive wire from the battery pack go to the power bus on the breadboard. But you can see that is not what I have in this circuit diagram. I have an extra switch connected to the battery pack, which is gonna allow me to turn power to the circuit on and off. And then I also have a button in series with one of the LEDs, which is gonna give me additional control to turn that LED on and off. So I have the button and the switch here in Tinkercad. And you see these have multiple pins. They're not as simple as these two pin components like the resistors and the LEDs. So it might not be immediately obvious how the pins on these parts correspond to the wires or the connections in the circuit diagram. So Tinkercad is kind of nice in that it gives you these little mouse over labels, which can give you some hints, but you're not gonna get that in real life when working with the physical parts. So to figure that out, we're gonna to need to learn how to look at these parts data sheets. So we'll start with the switch because I think that's a little easier to understand. When I mouse over in Tinkercad here, you see the middle pin is labeled common, and then the left and right pins are labeled terminal one and terminal two. So what's going to happen when I click on this switch, if I hit start simulation and click on it here, the switch toggles to one side. So when it's over here on the left, terminal one is connected to common and terminal two is disconnected. When it's over here on the right, terminal two is connected to common and terminal one is disconnected. We can see that if we look up a switch at a place you can get them like SparkFun and make sure there is a data sheet available. Sometimes switches like this are so simple that they don't have a data sheet, but this one does. And I can go on here and see that not only do we have physical dimensions of the switch, but we have a little electrical drawing. So SPDT stands for single pole double throw switch. So there is pin two labeled, that's that common pin in the middle, and the switch toggles between pins one and pin three. And you can look over here at the physical drawing of the switch to see pins one, two, and three labeled. So how those correspond to the electrical diagram. Now, in this case, they kind of happen to be in the same order from left to right, one, two, three. That is not always the case depending on the part. So you might encounter other parts later, particularly transistors, things that have three pins that aren't necessarily in order left to right, or the they might be labeled with letters instead of numbers, and they might not be in the same order in the circuit diagram symbol as they are on the physical part. We'll see more about that in the next video. But again, here, this switch is pretty simple. You have a middle pin and it's gonna to toggle whether that middle pin is connected to one of the two outer pins. So let's go back to our circuit diagram and we're gonna delete this red wire because again, we don't have the positive side of the battery connected directly to the power bus. We have it connected through a switch. So I'm gonna delete that wire and we are going to use this switch to toggle power to the circuit on and off. And remember, common mistake people make, don't put things in a breadboard like this. All the holes in a breadboard row are connected. So if I do that, all I have done is shorted all three pins of this switch together. I'm gonna rotate that switch 90 degrees and put it in the breadboard like this. Now I kind of have a choice of how I am going to connect my battery pack to the switch. So I'm going to say I want my common connector to always be connected to the power bus. And now I can route either side of this to my battery pack. So that way, when the switch is up in this position, terminal one is connected to common. So that's going to connect my buses to my battery pack and provide power. But when the switch is down in the lower position, common is just gonna be connected to terminal two, which is connected to nothing. So that's effectively just acting like an off switch or an open switch to turn the battery pack off. And we can see that if I now run the simulation, so the switch was on there to begin with because it is in this up top position, but when I click on it to turn it off, I'm disconnecting the battery pack and turning 
all of the LEDs off. So that is this switch here. You can imagine that line toggling up and down to provide power to the circuit. What I haven't done yet is connect this button to provide power to this individual LED. We're gonna do that next. And actually, before we do that, this is a good place for a reminder that the physical layout of the circuit does not need to match the physical layout of the circuit diagram. So it is just a coincidence that the switch is kind of in the top left of this diagram and I have also put it on the top left of the breadboard. So for example, I could have decided I wanted it in the bottom left instead, connected to the power bus down there, delete this wire and then reroute this wire all the way down here. There's electrically no reason not to do that. It's gonna function exactly the same, but physically maybe this is gonna get a little messy when you're thinking about routing your battery pack wires around your circuit. Now you, you could have them right next to each other and instead now I've run run all the way down there. But when I run the simulation, this is gonna work exactly the same. So again, physical location of the switch does not necessarily need to correspond to the physical location in the circuit diagram. So finally, let's talk about this button. This is a little more complicated and these tend to confuse people because they have four terminals, but the circuit diagram symbol is usually just drawn with two terminals like this. So again, let's pull up a data sheet for a similar button and see exactly how these four pins are connected. So if we look at this drawing here, we see the top view with the four pins, left, left and right, top and bottom. And here's the circuit diagram that shows how these are connected. So kind of inside the button here, we see that switch symbol that, again, sometimes it's drawn like this with a switch, sometimes it's drawn like this to indicate a push button, but electrically it's the same idea as something that's either open or closed. And what's interesting here is we just have a straight line connecting pin one to pin two, and another straight line connecting pin three to pin four. So that means that those pins are just always connected. The reason the button has four pins is really more for mechanical stability as opposed to anything electrical because you can imagine if the button only had pins on one side and was soldered to a circuit board as you're pressing it repeatedly it's going to flex and eventually break having pins on both sides like this gives it nice four nice mechanical anchor points so the stress is even across the button and it's not tilting or fatiguing as, as it gets pressed repeatedly so these pins here are really electrically redundant but when you press the button, it's gonna connect this top row, pins one and two, down to this bottom row, pins three and four. When the button is not pressed, then these are not connected to each other. So what does that mean for how we want to connect the button in the circuit? So look at our circuit diagram. We still have a resistor connected to the anode of this LED, but unlike the other resistors, I don't wanna go directly to the power bus with that one. I want to go to another row in the breadboard so I have somewhere to connect my button. Now you might think, okay, great. Now the diagram shows the button connected from that resistor to the power bus. So I'm just gonna connect it like that. And let's see what happens if I run the simulation there. I'm gonna start the simulation. This switch is on, all of my LEDs are on, but pushing the button doesn't do anything. The yellow LED is just always on. And to understand that, you have to remember how the pins on this button are internally connected. So Tinkercad is calling them 1A and 1B, whereas in this circuit diagram, it was pin one and pin two. But remember that pushing the button doesn't do anything here. These two pins are just always connected to each other and effectively just act like a wire. So all I've done here is effectively used a wire to connect this resistor directly over to the power bus. In order to actually use the button, I need to have a connection between the top row of pins and the bottom row of pins. So I am going to move the button over these, I'm just gonna stop my simulation first. The spacing of these pins works out such that they straddle this gap in the middle of a breadboard nicely. And I want my path to the power bus to go through the button down to this bottom row. So I'm going to add another jumper wire here. Now the path for current is from the power bus through the button from the bottom row up to the top row, but only when the button is pressed. When the button is not pressed, this will be an open circuit, then through the resistor and then through the LED. So again, people tend to get a little mixed up about how to use these buttons. They'll either put them directly to a bus like that or have them rotated 90 degrees incorrectly. So this is just shorting together those two rows and then the button won't do anything. So you wanna have the button rotated like this, usually straddling the middle of the breadboard and now I have that path for current to flow, flow like this. So if I go back to run my simulation, you see now this switch controls master power to the circuit from the battery pack 
but the yellow LED is only going to light up when I hold this button down. So we now have a working circuit, but this is a good point to talk about physical layout again, especially when you are getting into things like sensors and buttons. So if somebody is going to be using this circuit, it might be more convenient to have the button and the switch located physically close to each other. LEDs are usually kind of tall. So for example, in a real physical three-dimensional circuit, having a switch right next to an LED like this, where you have to reach around back here to use this switch versus pushing this button up front, could be kind of inconvenient or you might accidentally bump other things on the circuit. So again, when you're thinking about physically using a circuit and what you as the user have access to, maybe for example, it would be more convenient to have this button and this switch just all the way down here right next to each other. But then the trade-off is that now I have this wire coming all the way down there. But for example, I could get around that by saying, okay, I'm going to totally reroute my battery pack wires and also put the ground wire down there. I'm not doing a great job moving the wires around in Tinkercad, but you, you get the idea. Part of it is a matter of personal preference. Again, this is electrically equivalent. I can run that simulation and see that same thing works. This switch controls master power to the circuit and this button controls the yellow LED. Exact same electrical circuit. So every, what I just did is equivalent to this diagram, but different physical layout that's going to affect the user when they are actually using the circuit. So that's it for this video. Again, future videos in this series will cover additional topics like transistors, operational amplifiers, and integrated circuits like H-bridges. You can find those linked in the description below this one. And if you felt this one was over your head, you can go back and watch the first video in the series that covers the basics. Thank you.